So I'm going to, I'll tell you how I go about my work. Uh, I've, I've talked to a lot of journalism students. As far as I know, nobody has ever followed my advice. So I, I'll give you fair warning. Um, I think of, if you go down to the writer's workshop, you can envision there are two cabinets. And one cabinet we can call magic. And in magic, there is personality, experience, luck. Um, you can't do anything. I can't help you with that. Whatever is in the talent, you know, those things uh, I can't speak to. But you, you need to have the magic cabinet in your workshop. Um, but there's another cabinet that we can call craft. And uh, everything in there is something you can learn. Uh, and if you were to imagine that I'm opening this cabinet and it's full of boxes, the biggest and heaviest box would be research. For me, research begins oftentimes even before I've discovered the story. Uh, for instance, in 1991, uh, I was in therapy and uh, in Austin, and my therapist said that they were having meeting a lot of young patients, mainly young women, uh, who had multiple personalities, and uh, that in therapy they were recovering memories of satanic abuse. And then, and bear in mind, I respected these people and loved them, uh, but they told me that Satanists were responsible for 50 murders a year in Austin alone. Well, we've not, rarely ever had 50 murders a, a year in Austin. And I thought, where are they getting this? And then I got curious, and so I went to a workshop for police and there was a cop going around the country uh, holding these workshops. And he said that Satanists were responsible for 50,000 murders a year in the United States. We've never had that many murders in the United States. And these were cops. So, what is going on? And um, so I, I went to my editor at the New Yorker, Tina Brown at the time, and um, and I said I was interested in writing about multiple personality disorder. And she was not so interested. And I said, well, as it happens, when they're in therapy, they often recovered memories of satanic ritual abuse. <laughs> oh, that's hot, hot, hot. <laughs> she, Go get that story. So um, I started researching uh, cases uh, of accusations. Oftentimes, you know, they were young women who had recovered memories uh, in therapy, often for eating disorders, uh, and they would, uh, they would be uh, sometimes, you know, uh, just my father abused me, but oftentimes it was elaborate stories about uh, Satanist rituals and so on, and, and there were families all over the country being torn apart and it had gotten into the uh, daytime television world. Uh, Oprah and Sally Jesse Raphael and things like that would have these stories about this. And it had also infected the police departments. Um, and there was one person in the entire country who confessed to these crimes. And he was a deputy sheriff in Olympia, Washington. And uh, I thought, well, if there's anything to it, uh, this case will show, you know, maybe there are, you know, uh, these bands of satanic figures all over our country, uh, or maybe there's something else going on. And uh, so I decided I would write about that. So when I go off on a story, when I begin, I start by writing down the names of people that I've read about in the press who are involved in this story. I write their names down, and then in that little column on the left-hand side, that inch and a half column, I'll, when I get their telephone number, I'll write their telephone number down there. And then I go talk to them. And um, when I talk to them, my last question is, who else should I talk to? And they tell me names I haven't heard before. 
And uh, so I go talk to them and I ask them the same questions and eventually you run out of names and that way you've populated the universe of the story. Um, I also, um, you know, like with The Looming Tower, I talked to 600 people. Uh, and whenever I talked to somebody, I would highlight their name to show that I have already talked to them. And this actually turned out to be kind of useful because, you know, when you have that many names uh, in a legal pad, it was, you know, it's, it's kind of impressive. And uh, I was talking to an uh, FBI agent, and, you know, I was asking him, who else should I talk to? And I was leaving. And by then, I knew, instead of just going to the end, I would go th carefully through. So they get a gander at, you know, just, uh, and people would, I, I'd like to reconsider something I said a little earlier. You know, uh, you get, a, it's like a truth serum, that you feel that the, your subjects can feel surrounded, that, you know, you, you're, you're going to find them out, and I better talk. Uh, even the FBI. And I later found out that the, I had been using different colored highlighters only because I, they just happened to be at hand. But the FBI had decided that it was a code. <laughs> and after I learned that, I, I would really give them, you know, plenty of time to take it in, you know. And it's like pixie dust in their eyes. But, uh, but it helps to, you know, it, I call that horizontal reporting. You talk to it's the basic rule of journalism, right? You talk to as many people as you can. But there's another axis uh, that I call vertical reporting. Horizontal reporting is a, is a kind of consensus. Uh, and it helps you get a sense of, uh, if, if, if this is the universe of the story that I'm writing about, I try to talk to every one of you. And, uh, but some of you are gonna be more interesting. Some of you are gonna be more candid. Some of you will be uh, more insightful. And those people I'll go back to again and again. Bec and that's more about understanding and depth. So, you know, these two axes, you know, I think, uh, you know, in, in the pursuit of the truth is whatever we call it, the more people you talk to, you know, the broader your understanding will be. But th then there's a deepness that comes along with finding the characters who are essential to the story. So uh, that's a lot of people to talk to. Um, and of course, there's a lot of reading to be done. And, and, and I have a terrible memory. Uh, and so I have to put everything down on note cards. It's the only way I know how, it's like a, a net. You draw through the, the vast ocean of information that you've gotten. And I put it down, you know, on four by six cards. And it's very laborious. Uh, but you're not going to write about everything. Uh, you go through there and you find the things that have interest to you. And then you have to index those cards. You have to find a way to organize the information that you're intrigued by. And um, if for instance, I'm writing about Osama bin Laden. Well, I'm going to write about his family. Well, he had five wives. Well, I, you know, so I've got Osama bin Laden, you know, under that family, under that wives. And then, you know, under that Najwa, for instance, his first wife. Um, she married bin Laden when she was 14 years old. And uh, she was a particularly interesting character to me because when she married him, he was like, it's a little like, uh, oh, I ran into Meghan Markle this morning, by the way, so it comes, it comes to mind. You know, she must have thought she was going to have that kind of life. She is marrying, uh, you know, a, 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 a rich boy, and she's going to be walking down the Champs-Élysées, you know, in a mink coat. And, you know, years later, she finds herself in a tracksuit running around this Al-Qaeda compound trying to keep her weight down so that uh, bin Laden will still pay attention to her with all these other wives. But all, these, all the information that I've ever gotten about Najwa, from research, from talking to people, from you know, uh, translations, that I, goes into that card file. And the day that I finally get to write about her, I pull those cards out. Now, listen, it is front end loaded in terms of labor. But I found that it makes the writing itself go a lot faster. And I don't, I can't prove this, 
but I think that there's a sense that if you can, that the, the speed with which you're able to write to some extent translates into the ease with which the reader can get through it. It has a sense of momentum, and that's part of what I'm after. While I'm doing that, I'm in the process of looking for a central figure who can tell the story. Uh, and you can write a book, and there, you know, most books are like this, without central characters. Um, but to me, uh, I find that if you can find somebody that the reader cares about, then all the information that you're trying to convey is so much more meaningful. And I call that figure a donkey. It sounds disparaging, I know, but a donkey is a useful beast of burden. He can carry a lot of information on his back, and he can carry the reader into a world he's never been in. Uh, in the recovered memory story, for instance, the donkey was Paul Ingram, the man who confessed to this crime. And um, in the case of uh, the Looming Tower, uh, right after 9-11, trying to find a way to write about this vast tragedy. And how do you take something so massive and bring it down to human level? And for me, it's finding individual human stories that can tell a broader story. And so I started looking on, online at the obituaries that were streaming in, and one of them was John O'Neill. And uh, it made him sound a little bit like a disgrace. He had been the head of counterterrorism for the FBI in New York. And uh, he had taken classified information out of the bureau and he was washed out of the bureau. So he became the head of security at the World Trade Center. And you know, my immediate reaction was, so he, instead of getting bin Laden, bin Laden got him. And I didn't know if he was a hero or a goat, but he was a hell of a donkey. He could take the reader into a world the world of counterterrorism, and show why we failed. And so he became the first of my donkeys in that book. There are really four donkeys in the Looming Tower, Bin Laden, of course, and, um, and Ayman al-Zawahri, the then number two, but now number one guy in Al-Qaeda, and Prince Turki al-Faisal, who was the head of uh, security for uh, in the Interior Department for the uh, Saudi intelligence and uh, was a friend of bin Laden, went to school with Bill Clinton, uh, and as a donkey he could tell uh, the reader about the royal family in Saudi Arabia and the deal they made with uh, the religious establishment. So they, each, each of these donkeys has a purpose. Now, you, a donkey is different from the subject of a magazine profile, for instance. A donkey doesn't have to be glamorous uh, or famous. Uh, he just has to be in the middle of the world that you're trying to depict. And it helps if he's in trouble, like Paul Ingram. Um, when I was writing Going Clear, I was looking for a donkey. Uh, I thought for a while that um, John Travolta would make an interesting donkey uh, because his son had died, allegedly uh, in part because they would not get, administer uh, medicine that the church disapproved of. And, um, but my editor at the New Yorker thought that was too tabloid. And, um, but then Paul Haggis dropped out of uh, Scientology. Paul Haggis had been in Scientology for 34 years. He was a two-time Academy Award-winning writer and director. And um, he had not spoken about his decision to leave the church. A months later, I decided I was going to write about him, and I called his business manager, the only number I had, and I said, you know, I'd like to speak to your client apropos of his decision to leave the Church of Scientology. Are you kidding? We would never do that. Get the fuck off my phone. <laughs> the whole conversation. Mm. And uh, so I... Uh, Next day, I was able to get uh, Paul's uh, email address. So I wrote him a letter, and I said, I had, a, I had a conversation with your business manager. And he said, this wasn't the best time for you to talk. <laughs> um, but if there's ever a time you'd like to talk about your intellectual and spiritual development, um, 
I'd be pleased to tell your story. And 20 minutes later, I got an email back, very flattered, let's have lunch on Tuesday. So we had lunch on Tuesday, and uh, after that, you know, I said, you know, of course this is about your decision to leave the church. And his eyes got a little wide, but he forged on. Months later, he admitted it had never occurred to him it was going to be about Scientology. He was just so flattered the New Yorker was going to do a profile of him. He didn't realize he was a donkey. <laughs> and, but he was a very courageous donkey. And, um, and he helped me tell the story uh, of what it's like to be inside the church. Another box in this cabinet of craft is scenic construction. Uh, I write movies and I write plays. Uh, there's no narrative in those forms. It's all about scenes, one scene leading to another, and th seen through the eyes of characters. You don't have to write a book that way, but why wouldn't you? These are very, very powerful tools. And so, you know, my donkeys are my characters, uh, and I research them just as carefully as I research the facts. And when I come upon a scene, I, I research it just as, you know, with the note cards and the whole thing, just as carefully as I would the history of, of Al-Qaeda or something like that. I know this is going to be something that is going to be riveting for the, for the reader and will help um, tell my story. For instance, in The Looming Tower, there's a scene in 1979. Um, radicals take over the Grand Mosque in Mecca. For Saudis, a lot of them, it's, it was like their 9-11. It was, you know, uh, to this day, we still don't know how many people were killed. Uh, but this is the holiest place in Islam. And, um, and moreover, the bin Laden family built that mosque. Um, so it also serves as a curtain raiser for Prince Turkey, one of my donkeys. Uh, Prince Turkey was in Morocco when the, when the mosque was taken over and all these worshipers were kidnapped and held hostage inside the Grand Mosque. And so he flies back to Saudi Arabia. He goes to the mosque. It's night. Normally they have these mercury lamps that illuminate the, you know, this massive mosque. They were all dark. There were snipers, uh, you know, jihadist up in the, sni in the turrets uh, firing at anybody that moved. And there was a temporary uh, headquarters of the Saudi guard uh, that was set up in this uh, adjacent building. And so Prince Turkey uh, arrives and he goes over to the temporary headquarters and he reaches for the door and a shot rings out and the glass shatters in front of him. This brings us to another box in the cabinet, narrative devices. When a shot rings out, it's a good moment to just bring everything to a halt because the reader wants to know what's going to happen next. You could say a shot rang out, the door shattered in his hand, but he was unharmed and he walked inside, you know. Well, why would you do that? Uh, a shot just rang out and it gives you the moment to uh, pause and let the reader digest the fact that some major action has just happened. Don't resolve it right away. This is the moment where you can pause and talk about the royal family talk about the deal they made with the Wahhabi establishment and why we're here in the first place. And all of that gives, you know, the, the, I, the reader, because of the tension that is building up by, and then what, and then what, uh, that's what makes the pages turn. But what you're offering them at that moment is the vital information they need to appreciate what a, you know, the, the size of, of the moment that they're entering into. When I was writing about, um, recovered memories uh, and there was a, this panic that took place in Olympia, Washington after these stories of satanic abuse had taken place and another sh deputy sheriff named Jim Raby had been uh, accused uh, of being a satanic torturer and um, he insisted on a lie detector test. Um, 
and and he failed it. Um, now, I knew as as the writer for the New Yorker that my readers are going to think this is all BS. You know, this is just a you know this this can't have happened, and yet. Jim Raby failed a polygraph test. Um, and I knew I was gonna have to account for that. But this was a two-part story in The New Yorker. And um, so I ended the first part by saying, and he failed the test. And I knew the reader would be, what? You know, maybe there is something to this. It was, and they had to wait a week to find out. Mm -hmm. You know, if, it was there really a satanic pedophilic ring operating in the sheriff's department in Olympia, Washington. Uh, I loved it, but I then had to administer another polygraph test to Jim Raby. Fortunately, he passed that one uh, with flying colors, uh, but it was, uh, it, it gave the, you know, an enticement to the reader who was going to look forward to trying to answer that question. That's part of the joy, I think, of reading, is you're excited and you're intellectually challenged. Another narrative device is chronology. In one of my books, 13 Days in September, about the Camp David Accords, uh, it's, it's about Jimmy Carter, Amwar Sadat, and Menachem Begin in 1978, meeting at Camp David and forging uh, the one peace treaty in the Middle East that has survived the tr test of time. And um, so, the, in this case, I really did use chronology. Uh, Thirteen days are the days, how many days they were at Camp David. So each, you know, 13 chapters. But I also needed to tell the history of the modern Middle East. So I decided to tell it through the eyes of the people that were at Camp David. But it had to, but also it had to move in a linear fashion. And underneath that, the tectonic plates of the Bible and the Quran uh, and the Torah. And it also had to move in linear fashion. So the trick was to keep us all always moving ahead in time, not going back and forth, but you know, at three different levels. And for a writer, it was a real interesting challenge. Um, but I, in that case, I think chronology really helps. All of my effort is in the service of trying to achieve clarity. For me, clarity is the supreme aesthetic goal, so that the reader take, you can take in complex information and make it understandable and appealing to the reader. Well, I should talk about rewriting. To me, um, rewriting is when, is, rewriting is what people think of as writing. Uh, for me, just getting through the first draft is, uh, it's almost like just beginning the story. It's hard work. It's the worst part of it. Uh, you know, and it's not finished. Uh, you think it is. Invariably, you think, wow, I've done it. And what you need is someone, instead of giving you approval, will take a sledgehammer to it and say, you know, in other words, a caring editor who wants to make the material better without actually just killing the author in the process. Uh, I, that's when you sharpen the dialogue, you move scenes around, and, um, and then there's cutting. Cutting is like literary liposuction. You suck out all the modifiers you don't need, uh, you know, the, the extraneous uh, remarks, the, the smart-ass comments, the, you know, all the stuff that doesn't need to be there, you pare it down uh, until it's as slim as it can be. And these, you know, these are my methods. I, there's research, there's organization, um, there's donkeys, and scenic construction, narrative devices, rewriting, and cutting. That's the, you know, the essentials of my craft. Um, I could say more, but I've cut it. <laughs>